The second thing is ask the most important question that every client is dying to answer and then shut up. And that question is, tell me about yourself. Hello and welcome to Million Dollar Monday. I'm your host, Greg Mazzello, bringing you real successful people with real useful advice for people with big dreams. I understand big dreams. I turned an investment of $200 and a lot of great advice from some really successful people into my big dream, Proforma, that today is a half billion dollar company. Well, we have a unique guest today because he has two unique stories. One story is how he's built his own very successful business. The other story is about how he is a consultant and trusted advisor to very successful entrepreneurs and lots of other successful business people. So he brings great advice and encouragement to all aspiring entrepreneurs and people with big dreams. From both of those perspectives, I am excited to introduce to you my good friend and very successful businessman, Terry Fergus. Terry, thanks for joining us. Greg, it's always good to see you. As I said, we've known each other since we were 14, but we won't go into that with the public. But otherwise, that was great. Oh, goodness. It's all good, Terry. So let's start at the beginning. And uh, uh, yes, I have known you for a long time, but share with everybody kind of your growing up story. You know, what were those things that gave you your work ethic? What were those experiences in life from your parents or your education that gave you the desire to own your own business? Let's start sort of start there, The back, your background. Well, a lot of it is, as we all grew up, uh, we're all kids of parents that were were young people in the depression and they were all coming out of that. So a lot of our parents didn't have very much. Um, and in fact, uh, my father drove a bread truck and my mother was a grade school teacher in a Catholic school and she used to say it cost her money to teach. So it was, um, you know, so nobody had that. Neither one of them had a degree, a college degree, and, but they always aspired something better for us. And they taught us that. They said, you know, work hard, keep your character about you, and they'll, you'll get whatever ever level of success you can do. My father used to always say, and also keep your eyes wide open. And that's, that's what happened. So from there, as you and I met, we met in high school, a wonderful, wonderful place, St. Ignatius High School in Cleveland, yeah. where yeah. I ended up only coaching football there for 25 years along with everything else. But it was, we learned a lot from the people around us. It was a mixture of kids from all over the place and also some great fine teachers that really encouraged me to go on. Down to college, on to becoming an accountant and then on to my, the rest of my career. So it was a lot of people that took a kid who probably they could have kicked in the corner and said, I don't know, there's something about them we like. So let's let's push them along. And as my father said, keep your eyes wide open. And I did, and I listened. <laughs> yeah, I like that, keep your eyes, eyes wide open. I, I also think, uh, I, I say, and I think, I think this is what he might have meant, and to some degree was, be aware of opportunities that surround you, right? And uh, I, tell, I talk about keeping your antennas up because some people seem to go through life either not with their antennas up or not with their eyes wide open and seem to miss great opportunities that come their way and, and yet they, they sort of miss them. So tell me a little bit about your education that led up to um, eventually, I, I think that you worked for one of the big eight at the time, there was eight of them. Yeah. Um, you, you and I share that in common, although you lasted a lot longer than I did at Haskins and Sells. But, <laughs> but anyhow, so talk to a little bit about your education the beginning of your career, and then how that turned into starting your own business? Well, some of that really started, I, I started out at John Carroll University in accounting. Right. I didn't finish. <clears throat> After a little over three years, 
I just literally ran out of money. I was working full time, the whole bit. And I said, you know what? I just can't finish it. So I was working at a, a stop and shop food chain, Rigo's, that you would remember from Cleveland. Right. Right. There was a family owned. I was working there, but I had taken a couple of tax classes. So I started doing the guys in the back rooms taxes for $20 a tax return all by hand. Then there was no internet. And I kept going. I finally got married. And she finally said, why don't you finish your degree? So it was actually, it was almost six years later that I went back. And because she said, you're, you're really not doing anything. You're working at a grocery store. Come on, you can do more than this. My wife was a big inspiration. And so she worked double shifts. I quit. We had one child and the second on the way. We moved in with my mother-in-law, who was a very wonderful individual. And I went on the bus and finished at Cleveland State University. The turning point was a professor. His name was Professor Paul. He's been deceased now. But actually what he did was he came to me toward the, right before I was going to graduate. And he said, you know, there's the accounting beta alpha psi there. He said, I want you to go to it. I want you to sit at this one table. I said, Professor Paul, you forget who you're talking to. I'm not beta alpha psi. That's a smart kid. <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> just go. Well, I found out years later uh -huh. that he had actually been with Pete Marwick Mitchell, which turned into KPMG. Right. Um, earlier, I did not know that. And he had told these guys, don't look at his resume. Don't look at his grades. Just listen to him talk. So I go to this thing. The guys at KPMG gave me an interview and hired me. And I kept pinching myself, wondering, wait a minute, did you pick the wrong guy? <laughs> I'm not Ivy League, the whole bit. And so I started up the ladder and I did say one time, I hope I don't insult anybody on this, on this thing, but it's, they, when I did, I did the normal interview and I said to the partner in charge, how can I get your seat someday? And he knew, I didn't know at the time, you don't realize, son, I'm doing you a favor. He didn't say that. <laughs> he said to a favor, an old friend of mine, he said, Terry, the best students from the best Ivy League universities take a minimum of eight years. Roll the story forward. I was hired on August 2nd of 1982. So July 1st of 1990, I was elected to the partnership. August 2nd, 1982 to July 1st, 1990 is seven years and 11 months. Right. I said, Thank God I didn't go to Harvard because I had to wait another year. <laughs> of course, they all, they all said, now we remember why we should have never hired you. you there know? you go. <laughs> but they said that, I said, well, what was the reason? They said, because you could surround yourself with, the, with really good kids. You were one yourself, but you could make them work as a team. And you ended up generating business by utilizing everybody around you. And they said, and at the end of the day, a business, as you know, Greg, is bringing revenue in the door. Yeah. Being a good accountant comes in second to being a revenue generator. We all we all knew that. Yes, were you on audit tax? What what group were you with when you were with them? I went to tax, and most, of, believe it or not, was because I did the ones on the on the kitchen table. I uh, knew enough that most of the beginning students didn't know that, so I just knew how to get a tax return done. And I kept my eyes open, as my dad said. Yep, yep. <laughs> and of course, in the big four now now big four it was big eight. Right. As you know, the training was incredible. And I think after a couple of years, I had the equivalency of a master's in tax just by what they trained you in the training sessions they went you to. But because I could also speak and things like that, I eventually became one of the teachers in the firm besides that. The thing that actually probably put me on the map was in the 90s was, if you, you may recall, was the merger of all the big banks in the country. And KPMG did most of the big banks. So I flew around the country, jumping in and showing all the owners of small banks that are getting smaller for the big ones, how to A, keep their taxes down low, and B, now what do you do? And that's really where the business came from. It went like crazy. And the only reason I left was um, I, I was up to the operating committee of the firm and I was, I, was, I was one of the guys that founded the high net worth practice in 1992. 
And we built it from zero to a $130 million a year business when I decided to leave in 2001. And um, which for a $5 billion a year company, that wasn't a heck of a lot, but it was a lot to, you know, on any level, right? Yeah, to you <laughs> and, and me. And yes, and the, wow. uh, and the chairman of the firm said, Terry, did somebody upset you? Why are you leaving? Well, I left November 1st, 2001. I traveled 150 segments a year, but I used to get home all the time at three o'clock, wherever I flew so I could coach high school football. And I told the chairman of the firm, the international firm, I said, you know, my real job is coaching high school football. I just do this because my wife and kids like to eat. <laughs> he laughed, he goes, I said, but after 9-11, 2011, 2001, I could no longer get home anymore. Now it was going to be 75 to 100 nights a year out of town. And I just told them, it's not you guys. I've learned everything you can learn from a, from this. I will be forever indebted to you guys. Right, right. Now I'm going to take my high net worth guys. And if you don't mind, I'm going to take a few of these guys and we're going to go off and I'm going to start my own firm. And they agreed. They said, thank you for everything you've done. They were great firm. Wow, they did not keep you from bringing some of your clients with you. No, they said, Terry, you know, you know, you're not, you're not taking the Pepsi audit from us. <laughs> you know? And even though these were good clients, they said, we get it. I mean, it's really generating guys like you across the country. You know, one of the things I'm picking up on, though, Terry, is that um, you never, you never upset people. You know, in Italian, there's a saying that loosely translated means never spit on the ceiling because you never know when you're going to have to go back in that room. And one of the things I'm hearing from you, Terry, is you just have a great way of, uh, uh, of getting people to like you, getting people to trust you. And even when you tell them you're leaving their firm, they like you so much. It's like, here, fine, take some business with you. Rather than, you know, a lot of people, when they hear somebody's uh, maybe going to be trying to do stuff like that, they start getting out the lawyers and, and, and uh, get pretty legal. You must have a great skill at building relationships, building trust, and, and, uh, and creating great friends along the people that you've worked with over the years. Well, I always tell my, my staff, and I tell my guys now, is I tell them, when you meet somebody new, a new client, a potential new client, whatever, yeah. first of all, leave the tax code at home. Because if you start quoting tax code section, they have no clue what you're talking about. So I, so that I told them, I said, so first of all, always explain in English. The second thing is ask the most important question that every client is dying to answer and then shut up. And that question is, tell me about yourself. Because they're all proud of what they've been able to accomplish. Then they tell you about the pluses and the minuses. And if you keep your ears open, you not only find things you can help them with, but you learn a lot. I've listened to some guys tell the stories and it's helped me when I've tried to advise other people. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, it's like having a whole bunch of moms and dads around telling everything that, that all the things they failed at, you know, and you yeah. learn from that. So what you do is, and I told them, make your clients your friend. Because in order for me to help you with your estate planning or when you should sell or how you should sell, I have to know you. I have to know what makes you tick. Anybody can spew the code or have the, the canned answer. But what? makes it that it's important to you. Is it the right time for you to sell? Forget about the money. Are you ready? Are you ready to hang it up or not? Can you let go or not? And that's in the KPMG when I left, I still actually did some things for them because I had a specialty in the banks that they still wanted me to help teach some other guys first. So it was kind of a, a, a mutual thing when they said, and I told them what I was going to build and they figured, Eventually, those clients need audits, and <laughs> it's kind of a referral back because I don't do audits. <laughs> yeah. So, in building your own business, tell me some of the high highs and the low lows of building your business. The biggest thing is, is I'm sure you know, Greg, is the people. Yeah. Is finding the people with relatively the same value and that understand that it's the client first. I know that you all have lives and I don't surely don't want you to spend 15, 16 hours a day 
you know, working at, at the office. Most of the stuff we did, we were at the, the, the big accounting firms is because there were computers, they're doing all by hand. Let's hope the computer makes it a little faster, <laughs> you know? Uh, <clears throat> but the idea is, think of the client first. In fact, I have a philosophy because I don't have a, a million employees. Um, I pay for all their benefits, I pay for all their cell phones, and I pay for internet in their home. And I tell them, when my clients call, you answer. Because you're using that phone for yourself personally too. And a lot of times the clients are all over the world and they don't do the math, <laughs> the time zones. Right. And I've gotten some calls and my wife goes, what do you do? I say, hang on. And as soon as you tell them, okay, I'll do it when I get to the office, they always do the math in their head. They go, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I forgot the you know, time it is. Because yeah. always tell them that you care about it, and, but really do it. And it's hard to find people that do that. Yes, we make money. Yes, you'll make money working with me and for me. But if we don't have the common goal, we can't win. And I learned this, Greg, from football. I coach running backs and quarterbacks. And I tell the quarterback, whenever you can, you buy your lineman a can of pop or take them off for a hamburger. Because without them, you don't have time to do anything. And Good their advice. name never gets in the newspaper. Yours does. But without them, you don't go anywhere. So if I've got a great tax guy, a great um, a controller that can do the books for people, and I have a, a, a lawyer that works for me too that helps help mitigate between the law firms, um, I tell them, if, if we can't work together and count on everybody's counts because nobody's got it all, then we can't succeed. So don't be jealous because you think somebody else is doing better than you. They're not doing the same thing you're doing. Otherwise, yeah. I have them do it. No, and that's the thing is building a good team has been the hardest thing of all. You make a, a lot of people have to say, I like you, but you're just not fit. So what other lessons have you learned in observing the life of other very successful entrepreneurs? What other lessons about growing a business or, or other life lessons have you learned that you'd like to share? Well, again, a lot of times I, I tell people by getting involved in the community, like I learn more from those kids from coaching teenagers, I think, than sometimes they learn from me. Uh, and my wife said to me one time, why? So they kept me grounded. When you're flying all over the country and lecturing and going to Washington, D.C. and conversing with presidents and all those types of things, you can get pretty impressed with yourself. <clears throat> and then you go to a kid who, who's talking to you just about regular life. And he, you know, and so he doesn't want to hear your resume. He just wants to know what, what's the next play and how come he can't memorize it. <laughs> you know? And it keeps you grounded, you know. Okay. And why is he not starting? And how does he work to become a starter? You know, those types of things. I've learned a lot from the kids. I still learn a lot from coaching my own grandkids. And I coach them in their grade school things. Um, in my backyard, there's always been a half-court basketball court. Uh, and sometimes in the wintertime, they have to shovel the snow off of it to play. But it's but they are, it was always a community place where anybody could come. And so I tell them, when I say get involved, it's just talking to somebody sometimes. It's not necessarily, you know, paying for their education or doing anything like this. It's talking to them. And when you do learn, I talk to my clients, I listen to their lives, and I learn from their lives. I didn't wait for them to end so I could spew what I knew. They, they, I walked in the room because they figured I knew what I knew. <laughs> okay, you know. So now they're telling me about them. And I would ask them questions. Well, how did you get your first loan? You know, like the older, older guys, right out of depression. <laughs> how did you do that? You know, and they said it wasn't easy. We had a, it's a very colorful loan, as you can imagine at the time. <laughs> you know, we're all from Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, but they talked about, they talked about their failure. And you learn from listening. And I tell everybody in my office, learn from listening. 
Carrie, you've built a successful business. You work with very successful business owners and other successful people. You've built a, a wonderful life, a wonderful legacy. Let me ask you this, Terry. What big dreams do you have left for the rest of your life? Well, as you can imagine, I have a couple of kids who started their own businesses. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, one acquired a small little Marvel Granite company. She, so she acquired it in January of 2020, <clears throat> excuse me, right before the pandemic. And she panicked. But she, then she soon found out that everybody was redoing their houses. And so it, it actually came out okay for her. She was able to weather the storm. But one of the things I told them, one of the things we talk about with young businesses, sometimes you got to take that step back before you take that step forward. Because you have to make sure you've built a good foundation. And you and I know that from even you start to build it bigger. Is if you don't have that good foundation, you can't build it bigger because it'll all collapse. How's it going? So I want to help them with that. Um, I'll probably torture children for the rest of my life coaching them <laughs> on a basketball court. Um, my wife always says, Miss Dana, please don't use that line. <laughs> and I said, I said, okay, I got it. But, but I said, um, because there's a, I'll back up a little bit. Here's a story. My wife one time, before even when I started coaching um, at your old grade school, St. James um, in, in Lakewood, because I actually started coaching 45 years ago. I coached in grade school for 20 years while I was growing up through the big firm when I couldn't get to a high school football field by 3.30. <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. Um, so I, I did that. And if, before I started that, she said, you said you were you had cell phones back there. She said, you said you're coming home. She says, you're like an hour late. And I said, well, I drove by this this outside court and these kids, they weren't shooting the basketball right. So I got out and I said, I had to tell him, like, you hate to see a kid that, he says, you actually did that? <laughs> I said, yeah, why? And she goes, oh my God. <laughs> she oh says, my God. <laughs> he said, he said, I knew that was the beginning of the end and you're going to start coaching for real, you know? But yeah. I still, I love doing that now. I still want to do that. And as my chief operating officer said, she's 20 years younger. She said, even if you want to slow down and move on, you can't retire yet. Because she says, I don't have enough gray hair. <laughs> so she says, you got to be here. And I'll always be around for old friends because they get involved with their families because it's, it's usually right, generational. Right, right, right. And to just come into the family meetings and be that other, that other view, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Terry, it's great to spend some time with you here and what... Maybe my biggest takeaway um, is that I asked you about your big dreams and your big dreams are just all about other people. Your big dreams have nothing to do with you now. Your big dreams are just all about seeing other people in your family and otherwise succeed. And that just tells me everything I need to know about you, the heart that you have and the person that you are. Now, Terry, it's been really great spending some time with you. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for sharing your heart with all of us today.